What's up, y'all? This is Justin James Bridges, and you're watching China, China, China. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of my podcast. We have very special guest today, all the way from United States. We have Justin James Bridges. Hi, Justin. How you doing, everybody? How you doing, Shana? I'm good. How about you? Doing good. <laughs> I really love your hat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. When did you start wearing that? Because I see it in a lot of your for lot of your photos. Yeah, um, it was back in uh, around 2011, 2012. Started wearing the top hat. Yeah, I had a. Uh, I was in the wheelchair at the time, and uh, <laughs> one of my buddies had a top hat in his house, and we were just messing around. And uh, he was, uh, I was like, "Mind if I wear that?" He was like, "Nope." So I threw it on and wore it out as we went out and did some things, <laughs> and then uh, kind of just stuck with it and went out and got some, got a. Got some for myself. <laughs> right, right. Because uh, when I saw, like, first time I saw your photos, uh, it felt like, you know, a leprechaun or like, you know, some sort of, uh, you're trying to create that sort of Dr. Seuss type of uh, image, right? <laughs> My birthday is St. Patrick's Day. Oh, wow. <laughs> <clears throat> so, so Justin, how's the situation in uh, in in your in your place uh, with this COVID and everything, and also of of course there's election going on. So, how is it? <laughs> Our country is a little crazy right now, right. <laughs> and uh, it's been a little crazy for a little while. But uh, yeah, uh, COVID. You know, I I'm fortunate that we're out. You know, we're out in the country in upstate New York. Um, so we're out on the Finger Lakes area. We're on 35 acres, so we can be kind of away from everybody. And we have been for most of the time. And mm -hmm. uh, the few times that I have traveled, I've gone from my quarantine bubble to another quarantine bubble <laughs> in, in another area. Right. <clears throat> but um, yeah, the, it's it's been crazy to see how much and like in different areas like in new york they like a lot of people even though people complain about it and stuff like that in new york say a lot of people are wearing their masks and just doing their part you know just wearing their mask being safe washing your hands you know and we had the huge spike in the beginning but the spike kind of went down and now we're kind of you know it's not as crazy as some of the other places um but there's definitely parts of the country that i've gone through where like you know, we're driving through and see, and you can see people are not wearing masks and not socially distancing and just, I just don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If everybody does their part, it would be done by now. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so Justin, um, I, want to, I want to ask you about, can you tell me a little bit about your childhood and then how did you like got into music? Like, uh, what was your, like, first memory of uh, music? Well, uh, you know, I'm from Texas. I was born in Texas, uh, outside of San Antonio. And uh, grew up in Texas and um, traveled around a lot. And then we lived in Florida from when I was uh, 9 to 16 and then moved back to Texas. I graduated high school in Texas. Um, my, you know, first memories of music were, <clears throat> were things like... Uh, you know, my uncle was involved in the music industry. Um, and so he worked with uh, some bands, like he worked with ZZ Top mm. uh, and a couple other really cool bands back in the day. And so, you know, getting to see as a fan, getting to see that, that was cool. Getting to go to some shows, and you know, and he worked with a lot of big country names back in the 90s. And, you know, and so getting to go to some of those concerts and things like that was some of my earlier memories i actually didn't start playing music until i was almost 21 right and, uh, yeah i was in college and uh i was having dreams so most of my songs come from dreams and i was having all these dreams with a bunch of different music that i'd never heard before and i one day told my family i was like you know i i kind of want to get a guitar and start playing guitar and learning how to play music <clears throat> and uh my uh my uh, 
uh, uncle or my mom told my uncle he told artist he was working with Pat Green who's a Texas country singer and uh, they gave a guitar to my parents to give to me for Christmas and so I got my first guitar uh, Christmas I guess that was 2003 something like that right. and uh, <clears throat> started playing and I could not put it down <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what were your like favorite music back then when you when you were younger when you're starting um i used to listen to a lot of rock and roll when i was younger when i first started playing music um you know i was listening to a lot of blues a lot of soul and funk and rock and roll mm. um you know <clears throat> listening to a lot of stevie ray vaughan obviously being from texas a lot of stevie ray vaughan uh zz top um pantera you know listen to a lot of those kind of heavier rock and roll and then uh <clears throat> like judas priest i've seen judas priest play in concert a few times right and uh judas priest and things like that but then i was also listening to you know in high school i was listening to hip-hop listening to wu-tang and you know after when i was right out of high school i was listening to like swisher house and all them out of houston and so all that that hip-hop scene too and then old country like johnny cash you know kind of style of country <clears throat> right and then, uh, a lot of the doors doors and the beatles right <laughs> amazing <laughs> so yeah i mean you're influenced by so many different genres right <laughs> yeah that, that's kind of my thing <laughs> <laughs> so when you started playing guitar uh how did it start and so uh you played by the year or you took took lessons no i uh, i played by ear um So I played the first three years that I had my guitar. I played 12 hours a day every day for the first three years that I had the guitar. And I would give up sleep or work or school or whatever I had to give up to make sure I played that 12 hours that day. Yeah. I did that every day for the first three years that I had my guitar and just play by ear, you know, listening to, <clears throat> listen to like Jimi Hendrix and Muddy Waters, Lightning Hopkins, you know, like I, like I said, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Then, you know as i was playing you know i really dove into the doors and uh getting that kind of tone i was i was doing a lot of songwriting and um you know like i said so a bunch of my songs come from dreams about 90% of my songs come from dreams and so i get the whole song from the dream and then i just have to learn how to play what i heard in my dream and so wow. that's yeah <laughs> that's how i make my music. <laughs> so that happens like very often the the dreams oh yeah oh yeah i have very vivid dreams like my dreams are as real as this you know is is my reality <laughs> you know and so yeah. there's vivid is reality to me and uh sometimes it's me playing the song <clears throat> sometimes it's the song on the radio in the dream or sometimes it's like just background music or something you know just everything like that but but the first time i'll have the dream i get the full song everything in it all the parts everything and then if i don't learn it right away i'll start having a reoccurring dream but it'll only be segments of the song instead of the full dream right and so <clears throat> it's been like that that's you know i have over 70 originals and uh about right, 90% yeah. of them have come to me that way <laughs> so when did you first realize this that this is actually songs that actually coming uh, through these dreams um it was about a i mean it was right around when i started like realizing like oh maybe i should get a guitar to kind of play this because i've never heard any of this before you know and then that's it's kind of what took me into playing guitar you know right so <clears throat> So just it what was the like first song you wrote you remember what was your first song Um I wrote so I have a bunch of different songs I wrote a song uh, I don't remember the song off the top of my head but it was about I wrote like this little fun college song about one of the university I was at Texas Tech University mm. and wrote a song uh called The Matador that was about uh about my experience at Texas Tech um but my first song that i really like 
wrote and kind of recorded and still play to this day and everything like that is a song called Angel that I wrote um, about my friends that passed away. So. Right, right. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, start playing guitar. Did you did you had any bands or projects earlier? Did you play with anybody? Yeah, yeah. Band? My uh, my first project was a band called Leprechaun Theory, <clears throat> and it was uh, it started out as a three piece. Uh, myself, another guitar player, and a bass player. And I was playing rhythm guitar and singing. And then we had the bass player, uh, electric bass player, and then the um, uh, other guitar player, lead guitar player. And then it's uh, it morphed and we switched the members around and went to, uh, we got a drummer and a keyboard player. And then uh, a new guitar player, like a, the guitar player switched. And then eventually we switched bass players and I had uh, a bass player that was playing bass horns and keys, a drummer, a, a lead guitar player and me playing rhythm and bass. We would switch back and forth. Um, right. And so, and then that changed, uh, that again changed to, I brought my brother on, uh, Ryan Bridges, and he started playing bass for me. And um <clears throat> Then I had, uh, and then so we, we went back to a three piece. It was Jason Knowles on drums, Ryan Bridges on bass, and then me on guitar playing lead and rhythm and singing. Right. And a uh, little three piece power mm -hmm. rock and roll band called, and we were Leprechaun Theory through all those changes. Played South by Southwest as Leprechaun Theory a couple times. Right. So uh, what, when did you first start recording? Uh, my first recording was in 2009. 2009, we recorded Leprechaun Theory, and then uh, I recorded my first solo album, uh, Justin James Bridges' Hang On For The Ride, I recorded in 2011. Or no, I'm sorry. Yeah, 2011. That's right. right. <clears throat> so uh, starting as, as a band and then what how how did it go to solo like you were you're always thinking about doing your own solo album or well it really came down to um uh, i wanted to tour and travel and play and my bandmates weren't able to tour like that at mm. that time they had other they had other you know jobs and going to school to finish up college and things like that um and so i had an opportunity to tour in 2011 um so i was writing a bunch of songs and everything like that and i had an opportunity came up that i was going to be playing uh some different shows and some things and um a buddy of mine was uh working at the same studio he was a uh, he was a student through this course but he was working at the studio at uh, sunrise studios in houston texas Right. Uh, where's easy where's easy top recorded and um he hit me up one day and was like hey i need to do this project i need a musician to come in and record and i need to do a full session <clears throat> and i was like cool i was thinking about doing a solo album anyways <laughs> and so i had all these songs that i had written you know a bunch of blues stuff and uh went into the studio and we recorded and uh, i did the whole album in one take one right. shot um i think we were there in like seven hours you know six hours something like that but did the whole album in one shot that's how we did leprechaun theory our album too um forgotten memory we did that album uh 10 songs in six hours wow <laughs> <laughs> i was listening to some of your songs and what i really loved is that there are songs that it's simply just you and the guitar right it's a uh, very country and very very johnny cash you know <laughs> yeah i definitely have <clears throat> have a couple albums that are just me and the guitar just picking and just putting it all out there you know right because in that yeah that was my first solo album in that way yeah so in the 2011 album hang on the ride i was listening to that and i i love a couple of songs uh, i love live your way and then you had a song called Rock and Roll Man. I don't, I, is, 
Yeah. Is it talking about you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was born a rock and roll man. Just took me a little longer to understand. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, when you I know, check you, I you talk, can, I yeah. talk about my friend. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I talk about my friend Josh Cotton uh, in that song. Um, he's one of my best friends, and uh, unfortunately, he passed away. Right. It's been a long time now. It's been almost 15 years now. Um, but uh, two days before he died, uh, he called me and he was like, because we were supposed to be getting together. He, he passed away on July 1st. We were supposed to be getting together on July 4th. And uh, he called me. <clears throat> he was like, hey, man, I just wanted to touch base, make sure everything's cool for the 4th. And I was like, yeah, man. And he's like, yeah, I just, I just wanted to say, man, I'm really like, I really am impressed on how far you've come in such a short time playing guitar. He's like, I'm really like that. That he's like, I'm really impressed by that. He's like, just promise me one thing. I was like, what's that, man? He's like, promise me you'll never quit playing music. Wow. And I like, I laughed about it. I was like, yeah, yeah, all right, man. He's like, no, no, seriously, bro. Like, and he got like, <clears throat> sorry, I get a little choked up. <clears throat> he got a, he got. I'm dead serious on the phone and he was like no like i need you to promise me that you will never quit playing music and i told him i was like i, I promise you brother i'll never quit playing he's like all right i don't know why but i just had to say that mm. i was like all right man well i'll see you in a few days I'm like all right bro and then two days later he was killed in a car accident wow so that's where that song came from it it almost feel like your your friend uh, maybe felt that he's is is passing away or right yeah almost you know like and it was a freak accident too like he was driving somebody else home because they were drunk at a bar and he was sober mm. <clears throat> he was driving their car and a bunch of gravel got dumped across the road and it made the car spin out and they had a crash right and like and the person that was drunk survived and and he did not wow <clears throat> justin i see in in your in your in your youtube and uh, when i searched in youtube uh, you you play in a lot of these uh, festivals like uh, cannabis festivals and uh, so how did you get into those that uh, uh, sort of <laughs> playing on those festivals and also probably we should talk about your activism on cannabis <laughs> yeah um so in 2011 um uh, i had a friend that was uh a master grower um cannabis grower living in oregon mm. that was growing medically for patients and helping out a lot of patients and uh he told me that if i wanted to move to portland to help him grow that I could come up there and just help him in the garden in exchange for a place to live. And I could work on my music. Hmm. And I was like, okay. You know, like I was looking at what the next step was going to be in this point anyways, you know? So, um, you know, and I quit, I quit working my day job in 2010, <clears throat> uh, after I had, I was playing at the Houston blue society, um, after work one day, and I met, I was hanging out with Jackie Gray, who's the drummer for the Meteorites, the Houston uh, blues band from back in the 80s and 90s and stuff like that, 70s and 80s, I believe. Right. And uh, he told me when we were sitting out back, he's like, you want to know how to get good at the blues? I'm like, how's that, Jackie? He's like, you got to pay your bills with it. And so the next day I walked in and quit my job. And so I didn't have any job since 2010. Like, that's when I walked in and quit. And uh, started doing some stuff with, you know, I was doing some stuff with a radio station in Houston and playing some shows and things like that. Right. And then uh, <clears throat> my buddy offered me this opportunity to go to uh, Portland. And, uh, and then the radio company I was working with somehow heard about me getting an offer to go to Portland and called me and was like, if you go to Portland, we'll give you your own radio channel. <clears throat> and so I was like, all right, well, that's, two positive things to go to Portland. I can work on my music and have my own radio channel and right. learn how to grow cannabis and help out a bunch of patients. Okay, let's, let's try this out. And so I talked to one of my buddies who I knew did booking and he booked me a tour from Houston 
uh, across uh, through Texas, across uh, the country to California, and then all the way up to Portland. And so <clears throat> that was my first tour, and that was the Hang On for the Ride tour. It's when I released my first album. And uh, I toured in January 2011. It was the, uh, I had 200 copies of that album that I had printed, me and my friend printed at home, printed them off with a little laser disc and made the like, the packaging and everything made it look all professional, but we did it all at home. Right. <laughs> and like, <clears throat> took that and we, uh, we hit the road. And uh, I sold out of all my merchandise. I had t-shirts made and things like that. Sold out of all my merchandise and everything. I made enough money off that first store to live off of for six months. Um, right. Paying for everything I needed, all my bills, everything I needed for six months off my first tour. So I kind of, I know that's not, the normal experience for people's most tours <laughs> you know? right but um <clears throat> i had a great time and um uh, moved to portland oregon and my buddy introduced me to some people that he knew in the portland community and they had me come and audition basically uh to play at this big festival um and or it's actually first they had me come and audition to play at this little show called the care cup was like this private party like 500 people um and it was a cannabis event and mm. so they invited me to come play there and when i was auditioning for that somebody was there that happened to be the guy that's in charge of booking for portland hemp stock at the time which is a major festival in portland oregon major right. hemp festival and uh invited me to play at hemp stock as well so i played both of those events and then, uh, you know, because I was a medical cannabis patient, I have knee injuries and injuries from sports and things like that. And then, mm. uh, you know, in 2011, I, uh, at the end of 2011, I had a uh, crazy experience. I don't know if you want to get into that now or if you want to uh, hold off for a little bit on that. <laughs> but uh, yeah. it, that's kind of all ties into how I got into the cannabis scene. <laughs> right. Was it was it was it already legalized back then in Oregon or it was medical medical okay mm -hmm. right it was, for, it was a it was a really strong medical program you had to actually go to a doctor um, and you had to go it was three visit it was a uh, three months of consecutive visits to show that you had like an actual medical condition you actually had to go to multiple doctors and then after you got uh, after your doctor recommended it, then you had to go to a cannabis doctor and get a recommendation from them and then go and file with the state to be able to be a medical patient. Right, right. <clears throat> it was so, a long process. <laughs> right. So so it, it's it's not like that anybody can just abuse it, right? Right. It's really hard. Like, you actually have to go to the doctor and things like that. Like, you can't just, you know, it's not really one of those things that you can just go and, at least, you know, I know there's some places that are like, oh, yeah, you know, it's a medical. And in my opinion, honestly, like, <clears throat> everybody has an endocannabinoid system, just like you have, like, just like you have a respiratory system and a circulatory system, you have an endocannabinoid system. Right. And that endocannabinoid system, all it does is absorb and produce cannabinoids. That's it. And it helps your body maintain homeostasis. It helps regulate your body systems. Right. That's what it does. And so, like, some people need it. <clears throat> if they have a cannabis deficiency, if they have a cannabinoid deficiency, they need cannabis. If they don't have a cannabinoid deficiency, they don't need cannabis, you know? And, like, it's not for everybody, but for the people that it really helps, it really, really helps. Yeah, <laughs> you know? right, right. <clears throat> So your your 2011 album was Hang On The Ride and then you have another 2013 album, Long Road To Nowhere. So and I, I, I sort of seeing this, your, your naming of your albums is like something to do with going somewhere, right? Hang On The Ride, Long yeah. Road to, and On My Way. <laughs> what is the yeah. thought process? Where are you going? What is this uh, journey? <laughs> well, that's that's always the question. I'm, you know always trying to move forward and better myself, you know, so we're all on this journey, all trying to, you know, trying to spread as much light as possible, you know, right. across this journey. And so <clears throat> I've been learning along the way. 
Yes. Uh, one song I loved, I liked from the 2013 album is you had a song called Sing For Me, which is a pretty nice, yeah. nice song. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that song? Yeah, so Sing For Me is actually, uh, it was a different version of that was a Leprechaun Theory song. It's one of my earliest songs. Right. Um, I actually have three versions of that song. <laughs> so I have the one that you heard on that album. Uh, I have a faster version of it. And then I have like a bigger, like full band, more rock and roll version. Right. Um, but that song uh, came to me. <clears throat> I had a friend. Uh, I had a friend of mine that I met in college and uh, she was really shy, but she had an amazing voice. And, uh, you know, so I was playing around one night and like was trying to get her to sing with me. <laughs> so I started singing that song and it just like hit me. <laughs> and I, I just played it and sang it to her. And uh, yeah, it's just a nice little love song. Nice little. Yeah, know, but uh, to... I mean, I feel that it's a band song because if I if I didn't know it was uh, Justin James Bridges, I I think that song can pass like a Pearl Jam song or maybe, right? Because the vibe is exactly the... Even your vocals is very close to Eddie Vedder's uh, way of singing, Thank you. right? On that song. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I think if it is a blues album, if you're writing a blues album, you have to have a song about devil, right? So you had the devil ain't got shit on me on the on that same album. <laughs> can can, yes, can you tell me about that? Because that's sort of something that all blues artists talk about, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, you know, I had this dream, you know, a lot of blues artists talk about selling their soul to the devil to be able to play, you know, yeah. that's the Robert Johnson story, you know, the good old went down to the crossroads, sold your soul to the devil made a deal with the devil and uh i was trying to put that spin on it that like he couldn't keep up with me so i didn't need to make a deal <laughs> you know like that was the dream and in, in my dream it was like he came up and tried to make a deal with me and i was like well come out with us for a little bit let's see how that goes and by the end of the night he was like uh-uh <laughs> so. Yeah. so justin you told me that uh there was certain uh, unfortunate event happen in your life. Uh, yeah. So uh, related to you, you know, you're joining the protest or activ activism, right? So can you tell me a little bit about what happened? Yeah. So uh, again, <clears throat> my songs, um, you know, come from dreams. And I had the song Mysteries that uh, is on my album, On My Way. And that song came to me before Occupy happened. And I, I don't know if you remember Occupy Wall Street. Yes. Um, yeah, so it was during Occupy Wall Street and it, I was living in Portland, so it was Occupy Portland. And, uh, you know, while I was there, we, I had, you know, I had this dream. It's had all the vernacular from the Occupy movement, you know, talking about the 1% and things like that. And, uh, and then Occupy happened. And I was like, oh, this is, this is this, <laughs> that song is what, that's what this is about. Mm. And so I was like, okay. And so I went to, with one of my buddies to go try to get a video of me playing that song and like recording with the crowd marching and everything to kind of, um, to kind of help galvanize more people and bring more people out to the movement and try to show more people and try to push for real change, you know? Um, art inspires change you know artists we have the power to be the catalyst to make the difference right you know we can be the catalyst to make change and so um that's what i was went down there to do mm. and uh i used to be an interpreter for the deaf um back in uh i started learning sign language in high school <laughs> and so i was an yeah. interpreter for the deaf for a long time and so uh i went down to occupy and um while I was there, uh, I saw a group of deaf people asking what was going on and looked around and there was no interpreters. And so I got up next to the person that was giving the speech and started interpreting what they were saying. And then I ended up being the only interpreter at camp. So I stayed there 
and I was there the entire camp. Um, I think I missed two days out of the entire time. I think mm -hmm. we were there for 39 days. Um, and then uh, I was interpreting for the deaf at a meeting when the police came through to clear out our camp and uh, they started attacking people and pushing people. And uh, so we got outside of the park or we're at the edge of the park and they started pushing people and hitting people and like pushing people back and somebody had their hand on my back and when they moved their hand I was pinned up against a concrete trash can and the cops pushed and my back popped and my legs gave out and uh, I couldn't feel my legs. Yeah. And, uh, I got checked by the police and I hit the ground and uh, I was telling them I couldn't feel my legs and calling for help. And, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, one of the police officers grabbed me by my ankles after being told I couldn't feel my legs. And he dragged me out from the protesters back into the park and they flipped me over and slammed me down. And when I put my hands behind my back, they said I was resisting arrest and started stomping on me and hitting me with batons and kicking me, and jumping on my back and dropping knees on my back. And uh, there were six officers that attacked me and uh, they hit me so hard with the baton that it split my leather jacket. Oh. And, yeah. And they uh, were kicking me, hitting me. Um, and then after I couldn't stand up, they zip tied my hands behind me and grabbed my hands and pulled them past my head behind me and then grabbed my ankles and pulled them to my wrists in front of me. And then they grabbed me around the bandana around my neck and they twisted and picked me up and they hung me until I went unconscious. Wow. Last thing that went through my head was... If I just got killed by the cops, <laughs> like mm. it was, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, it was crazy. So, how long were you uh, affected from this? You you took time. How long did it take for you to recover from this? Physically, I mean, mentally, probably, <laughs> maybe even longer, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm still dealing with side effects today. You know, this is in 2000, this is November 13th, 2011 is when I was attacked. Right. And uh, if I don't have my cannabis, I have leg spasms and back spasms today. You know, um, I spent over three years in a wheelchair. Wow. Close to three and a half years. Uh, from November 13th, 2011 to uh, the first week of March, 2015. Right. I was in a wheelchair. So was was there any justice for this? Uh, was any action taken on that? Uh, <clears throat> I tried to sue the police. Um, I ended up getting 28 death threats from police officers. Mm. And uh, I tried to settle my case and my lawyers promised me a certain number and went to do all this stuff, had me sign over uh so that they could do all the like negotiations and everything. And they came back and said that the city gave us $5,000. And after fee, after the lawyer fees, I got $2,300. Mm. I spent over three years in a wheelchair. And uh, two of the officers that attacked me got promoted. All right. It's, uh, I mean, I, I mean, even, even like, few months ago right we there was this situation again i mean it's it's happening it's 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 always happening that it's uh um and then what do you what do you what do you feel when you hear this like for example the joy george floyd's case what happens and there were another yeah, case. man like george floyd a lot of people don't know this but george floyd was a rapper that was big floyd from swisher house right from the school click from dj screw and all that like he's actually he's a musician right um, that's why houston was in that's why it was such a big deal in houston i mean it's a big deal anyways you know nobody should be killed like that anywhere in the world 
you know, nobody should ever have to deal with that. You know, um, it's insanity. What what do you what do you think should happen? What what is why is it happening and what should what should what should really what's the real action There's for this? No accountability for police officers, man. Right. Police need to be held accountable. You know, people need to be held accountable for their actions. You know, and the the system needs to change. We're not the system is broken. It's been mm. broken. You know, the system was set up. I mean, if you look at the actual history of American policing and where it actually comes from, you know, the state troopers come from the police that were helping the railroad, you know, and so private company police doing, you know, whatever that company wanted them to do. Right. You know, and then the with the Jim Crow laws, <clears throat> you know, a lot of police forces were set up specifically to try to arrest newly freed slaves and put them back into custody so that they could use their slave labor again. In this country, slavery is illegal unless you've been arrested. Right. Like if you're in jail, they can use you as labor. Yeah, there's a, I mean, insane. Private, private prisons, are, it's a big business also, right? Yeah, it's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. There's no way, like, in no just society would there ever be a private prison. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's, it's incredible. And like, we call ourselves, you know, we call ourselves the land of the free, but we have 20, you know, we have 25% of the world's prison population. Right. And we have what? 8% of the world's population. There's something wrong there. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I think one thing that's really contributing to this is uh, <clears throat> this failed uh, drug war, right? Because people are mostly, a lot of people get jailed because of very petty uh, drugs like maru like weed, right? Because that's... Uh, yeah. What do you think about this drug war that it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's insane. Stupid, I mean, it's, right? it's affected, it's affected so many lives, including my own, you know, like I've been arrested for medical, for having my medical cannabis on me, but I was in Texas. Right. They arrested me and they tried, to, they wanted to give me 20 years wow. in jail for possession, you know, and I have, I got a, I had a really bad lawyer at first and I ended up getting a warrant not knowing you know that I had was in trouble and because I thought my lawyer was taking care of everything and then I was in a car accident and got arrested from the hospital and taken to jail not knowing I had a warrant and finding out my lawyer didn't go to court for me and then I was in jail they had me in jail on a hundred thousand dollar cash bond which means I had to pay a hundred thousand dollars in cash to be let out right. for possession of cannabis I was in jail at one point. They put me in max security because I had a leg spasm from not having my cannabis. So instead of putting me in the infirmary, they put me in max security. Wow. And I was in between a rapist and a murderer. And my bond was the highest bond there. That mm. is insane. I wasn't distributing. I didn't get charged with. I wasn't distributing or anything like that. It was my personal, my medicine, my cannabis, <laughs> you know, that I got in trouble with. But all that said and done, I uh, I am the first person in Texas state history that was legally allowed to consume cannabis while on probation. Right. So my probation is going to be finished soon, and uh, I've been able to consume cannabis and have my medicine the entire time. I set precedents in Texas. Right, right. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you have, <clears throat> you actually have another album. I think it's also came on 2013, right? On my way. Yes, uh, sir. I, I, you, I think you remember that I, I actually wrote "Wake Up" when I, when I sent it to you yeah. because the album cover reminded me of like "Rage Against the Machine," like the fist and. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
you said that you actually do most of the all the artwork for the albums as well, right? Can you tell me a little bit about yeah, how you got yeah, into that? Yeah, I do. I, I do all the graphic design. Um, I do a lot of graphic designing and a lot of uh, artwork. I make jewelry, steering. Mm. Wow. <laughs> jewelry and things like that. I do all sorts of random fun stuff. <laughs> But yeah, I make uh, I do all the graphic design on most of my albums. Um, you know, I did uh, <clears throat> not much of it. Now a lot of it isn't there. Like my Leprechaun Theory album, I teamed up with Megan Reddick. She did the album cover. Uh, she body painted somebody that was standing in a field and then took a picture that lined up with the clouds and all this crazy stuff that these amazing artists that I work with do. And she did that. And then all I did was add the name of the album and stuff digitally onto that picture. And that was my first, you know, album cover. And then with same thing with hang on for the ride, uh, Dilee Hermes and, uh, <clears throat> and Hannah and Carlock, they, uh, they did the body painting and photo for hang on for the ride. And, uh, I did the graphic, you know, added the added the title to it and everything like that. And then I completely made the long road to nowhere. I actually took that picture of the clouds. Mm. I took that picture from a plane window and uh, <laughs> up the plane and then did all that graphic, the digital design yeah. to that. Uh, I think long road to nowhere. Another way to express myself. Yeah, long road to nowhere album cover reminds me of another another band's album cover which kind of similar i think you I, i you know the band nickelback yes but i'm not a fan yes. so i don't know what any of their albums look like <laughs> they, they, have a, they have something like wrong long road something album that has a similar angle picture oh feel <laughs> yeah now you you had a I, i i was pretty excited about this 2017 you put out a teaser living it up with uh, you featured uh, the holy child uh, it was featuring holy child is it going to be yeah. a full full fledged album can you tell me a little bit about that <laughs> so that was a teaser of kind of like things that are to come so i have well i have these two albums that i just did that i just recorded but i have four more albums in the works so i have a blues album a rock and roll album a funk album and like a pop love song kind of album right and uh that was some songs from a couple of different things that will be used in different uh on those different albums so it's like this is kind of like a sample of what's to come <laughs> right right <clears throat> uh justin you uh what we talk about the earlier your incident you actually wrote a song out of that right boys in blue yeah uh have you yeah, actually boys in blue yeah go ahead um that was that was the first song i wrote after being attacked um so from that attack i was unable to move my right arm for six and a half months right um and i play guitar for a living <laughs> you know so i couldn't move my arm Um, I was attacked November 13th, and then on Christmas Eve that year, uh, my thumb started to twitch. And I couldn't move or feel my arm, but my thumb started to twitch. Mm -hmm. So I taped my hand to my guitar, and my thumb would do this. And so I taped my arm to where my thumb would twitch over the strings, and then I would fret, because my fret hand still worked. Mm -hmm. And so I would get it to twitch, and then I would hammer on and pull off. And I just kept doing that. And that's how I started rehabbing my hand. Right. And uh, I was, it was March, right around my birthday. My, like I said, my birthday, St. Patrick's Day is right around my birthday that uh, I had that dream of the song Boys in Blue. That came, that was a whole, that was, that was a full dream, you know, the full song of the dream and everything. And I had to figure out how to, how to play it but I couldn't move my arm. <laughs> so I had to like figure out how to improvise, how to make those sounds and how to play it, like to originally write it. And then uh, eventually got to where I could actually play and my hand was working. Right, right. <clears throat> uh, you've been doing a lot of collaborations with different, uh, different artists. You work with a lot of different artists. The one guy that, yeah. uh, <clears throat> that, frequently comes up is that you you work with Muruga Booker right 
uh, I, I believe he even played in in the original Woodstock, right? <laughs> yeah. He can did, you tell yeah. me little, can you tell me a little bit about him and then how he how you actually met him and how you started working yeah with him? yeah uh so maruga <laughs> it's great um maruga is uh he played at the original woodstock um he played with john lee hooker right with hooker and booker um he recorded with bob dylan uh he recorded uh he played with dave Brubeck. Um, the weather report, you know, uh, he got to jam with Jimi Hendrix, <laughs> you know, like he's wow. played with all of these legends. Uh, he played with George Clinton, the parliament funkadelic for like five years. You know, he was in studio with them recording, playing concerts and everything. And, uh, he's one of the P-Funk all-stars, lifetime member of a P-Funk all-stars. Um, he also played with Jerry Garcia. Uh, and Merle Saunders and Jerry Garcia and the uh, uh, blues from the rainforest. Right. And so the list goes on and on and on and on. It's, it's insane. Um, and uh, yeah, he's an incredible musician, right. you know, musician. He's also a yogi and an Orthodox priest and a shaman. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. He's like gone around the world learning all the shamanic beats from the shamans and from the gurus and like learning all the different drum styles on all the different continents. And like, he was the 1991 voices, uh, Hiroshima voices of peace award winner. He was a United States representative. So he's a, he's a very brilliant and uh, amazing person. <laughs> you know, he is, right. he is someone else that's trying to spread the light and, uh, you know, push that we are all one, you know, we're all from stardust, <laughs> you know, yeah, we're all from the uncreated light, you know. <clears throat> no matter what religion you are, you know, it all goes back to the source, <laughs> you know. So when did you first meet him? How how did you meet him? <laughs> uh, so we met. Uh, actually, we met early 2019. So last year, right. we met. Um, <clears throat> we uh, we played a show in Michigan together, um, and just met briefly. Uh, a mutual friend of ours was like, "Hey, I just want to introduce you to Maruga." I was like, "Oh, from People?" <laughs> He's like, "Yeah, the People drummer." I was like, "Oh, yeah, let's go." <laughs> and right. So we go over, and he introduces me. We shake hands, and just he was packing up his drums. I was getting ready to play, so it was just in passing, like, "Hey, nice to meet you." Mm. And then a uh, uh, couple months later, I was doing a video shoot, uh, working on some stuff over at my friend's house in Michigan, and he invited. A bunch of people over including maruga right. and so maruga showed up and he's the inventor of the nada drum so it's kind of like a talking drum but you can uh it's it's got a floating uh like ring on it so it's got straps that go down the side so as he like he can warp the tone and pitch while he's playing the drum so yeah. he can play keys and different <clears throat> tones and different things like that so you can um he can actually make it play in key and play notes and things like that on a hand drum. And so he brought that over and he had that and I had my guitar, my custom guitar, and he played a little lick on his not a drum. And then I played the same lick back to him on my guitar. And then he like looked over at me and I like smiled and we like made eye contact and then he played a lick and then I played a lick and then we started going back and forth. And then we started going faster and faster and faster and faster. And then we started getting into this like Eastern jazz kind of feel mm. like, and just playing these licks back and forth to each other. And then both of us started laughing. I was like, I really dig what you do. I was like, I really dig what you do, man. He's like, I dig what you do. We should do it together. I was like, all right. <laughs> and so we started planning to get into the studio and uh, then COVID hit. <laughs> mm. And, right. uh, you know, so it got postponed and he was setting some things up, built out a new computer and stuff like that in his studio. Um, his studio in Michigan, his home studio, uh, was designed by Bob Dennis, who was quality control for Motown. Right. <laughs> and so the guy that made the Motown studio built his studio wow. to the same specs and sounds and everything like that. So it's got the same kind of vibe, you know. It's a great, it's amazing. <laughs> and so, 
um, I just happened to be passing through, you know, I was going to be, I was working with some people and working on some projects and I was going to be going through, um, Michigan and I hit a Maruga and was like, Hey, I'm going to be passing through. Like, you know, I've been quarantined this whole time. Have you been quarantined? He's like, I haven't gone anywhere. He's like, I have everything I need here and I can get things delivered. I'm good. Mm. And so, uh, we set a time and I came through and we went to the studio and I knew that we were both prolific musicians, but I didn't realize we were going to do what we did. And, uh, this is some of, in my opinion, this, these two albums coming out are some of the best things I've ever done. Um, and, uh, it, it was incredible. He brought in, uh, he brought in a bunch of other musicians as well. So we have on the album, um, so we have two albums. One of them is The Boom, uh, is the name of the band. And the right. album is One Durland Tour. So it's D O N E and then Durland, D E R L A N D Tour. So One Durland Tour. Right. And uh, you get, and on that one, it's a concept album where you get sucked into Durland where all is one. <laughs> and so it's a, uh, it's definitely a magical little journey. It takes you on a ride through the whole like getting pulled into this magical world and then going through these different parts of the different parts of Durland and kind of taking you on a journey. But the fun thing about it is, is it's disguised as like a psychedelic dance, fun party album, but really it's a healing shamanic album. Right. Uh, Maruga is playing healing shamanic, like shaman beats through and different, like from different regions of the world through every song. <laughs> so right. like, He's playing African style drums on some. He's playing Native American style drums. Um, he's playing the tabla on some. Uh, and so, like, it's just a bunch of different, you know, a whole bunch of different sounds right. that we're taking you from all around the world. And uh, on that album, we brought in um, on two of the songs, we have Tony Newton, who is the bass player for Motown and for Michael Jackson. Um, he, uh, he was the bass player for the Temptations and the music director for the Miracles um, right. at Motown. And uh, so Tony Newton is on bass on two of them. Then we have uh, uh, Tony Strat P Funk Thomas from George Clinton and the Parliament Funkadelic. He was the guitarist on Atomic Dog with P Funk. Mm. And David Winans, the second from the Winans Gospel Family, is on the album as well. And uh, Amiko is actually putting her keys and her organ over the albums right now as well. So, uh, but <clears throat> we also, uh, we did a live album and uh, that one is more like funk, rock and roll, blues with a little bit of avant-garde jazz mixed in. And uh, that one is, uh, it's Maruga, myself, um, Tony Strap, P Funk Thomas, David Winans, um, Amico is on the album as well, and uh, my and then Maruga has uh, his wife Shakti Ma sings on a couple songs with us, and then my two year old is playing harmonica on one song. Wow. <laughs> in key and in time, <laughs> and her older sister. Is uh, plays harmonica on the song as well, but she sang one of the songs that she wrote, and so her three and a half year old. So I have a three and a half year old that sang one of her own songs wow. on the album. We played the music, and then she played. They played their harmonica tracks over it, and then afterwards she looked at me and she goes, "Daddy, this is what my song goes on." And I was like, uh, "Oh, she goes, this is my song." And I was like, "Yeah, you played your harmonica." She's like, "No, this is what my song goes on. I want to sing my song to this." Right. Like, okay go ahead <laughs> she sang her song and so it's called i've been having so much fun but that's on the uh, that album's called booker and bridges paid your dues right <clears throat> so uh i had emiko on this podcast in an early episode uh is it is it the first time you're working with emiko yeah yeah we uh we met through uh through some uh social media stuff Right. And then uh, now Miko and I are working on Yay together, Yay Plus. And uh, yeah, this is our first time to be working musically together. And it, it's it's awesome. Uh, she sent back a little sample of uh, one of the songs and 
it's she's an amazing musician it's great yeah so even uh, i mean i i got introduced to you also because of the same sort of community that that started so can you tell me a little bit about a plus what you can say right now yeah so we are a uh, we are a positive community um we're pushing positivity and it it right now it's starting with music you know but it is more than just music it's it's everything positivity like you know right now there's a lot you can go anywhere and you know find bad news right now right. <laughs> you know it's everywhere you know you're we're kind of overwhelmed with it and we're not we're not negating or you know taking away from the negative you know like we don't want people to under like we want people to understand we understand that there's negative you know that's not we're not trying to ignore it right. we're saying here is some positive to help you get through <laughs> you know like you know like we're we're trying to show all the different positive things that are going on we have a campaign right now um called what makes you say yay and uh or just say yay or say uh you know and so people are sending in videos little short clips of them like what makes us say yay and you know some people were like bowling and this one cute couple was like what makes us say yay and this husband was like this and his wife popped in she goes our anniversary <laughs> so like it's just like all sorts of things like that you know it's just stuff that makes people happy and smile and you know we are going to be launching a website soon so we're going to have a website up we're doing a concert series a charity concert series which i am going to be playing um we start we're, right now you can find us on facebook and on instagram um, nice. yay plus on facebook and uh, mm -hmm. yay plus official on instagram um and on our Facebook page, we're going to be doing from Facebook Live, we'll be doing uh, a charity concert series. And so this Friday, I'll be performing um, at 11 o'clock Pacific or Eastern Time, U.S. Um, and then right after my performance uh, at noon Singapore time, uh, Alif will be performing. Right. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, but it's it's a lot of fun. It's, it's, it's a great place to be right now. You know, like being around a bunch of people that are pushing positivity and pushing to help create a positive outlet for artists and for a community in general, you know, at large. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a really good thing because what you see in, I mean, the, the, the way that they engineered the social media is, you see most of the triggering sort of things that you you will always see those things right they will push all these things to you uh, so exactly. it's really happy to see like uh, some positive stuff is i mean that's what i've been also been trying to do put out a lot of music and uh, you know those things and even this podcast i started because it's a it's it put out a great story great ideas right that needs to be there out there yeah um right now with the election and all this and all this you know social media how do you how do you keep peace of mind uh justin with all the worlds what's happening with the pandemic and everything <laughs> yeah um my music and my family <laughs> you know i have two beautiful girls and it's kind of you know i I've been, you know, it, it was definitely, it's definitely a hard situation to be in. I'm, I'm, I'm really tired of being in a country where we just, it seems like we're picking from the worst two people right. every time. And I, I, I would prefer a situation where we get to pick from the best two people in our country. <laughs> like, you know, people that would actually, in my opinion, be good leaders. Um, but you know, with everything that's going on, like, we have to change. There has to be a change. You know, we right. can't, we cannot continue on this path. <laughs> you know, it, we have to make change. And, and we need to push for more positive change, too. Like, the thing that I hope is that whatever way it goes, you know, I hope that people keep pushing for positive change. Like we need to leave the world a better place than where we got it. We don't right. need to destroy it and make it worse for the future generations. We need to do everything we can to improve for the future generations. 
You know what I mean? Like, it's you're not winning if you're the only one that's winning. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, mm. it. You know, I, I I truly believe that like there's enough for everyone. You know, there's enough on this planet for everyone. We can all we can all take care of each other you know it doesn't and i'm not talking about like you have to pay for everybody and do all this like like everybody could just be kind to each other right you know like right you know there doesn't have to be all this divisiveness and all this anger and frustration all the time you know and i've been a you know i've been a party to it myself you know like i've i have ptsd i get triggered because of my issues with the police and things like that you know and i'm still working through those things you know right. there's a lot of stuff that you know it's I just, I, I would like to think that I'm trying to be a better person every day, you know, and I feel like if we all do that, you know, then we can make some things happen. One yeah. thing Maruka says all the time is world peace through inner peace, tolerance, love, and understanding. Exactly. Yeah. Because you have to be, uh, I mean, you have to be have a, have your peace, inner peace, and then you have to be compassionate to yourself before you can actually do it outside, right? To show it to others. Exactly. And what I think what is really important, like like you and me talking, like all these ideas needs to be discussed and uh, listen what the other person has to say, and you know understand where that exactly. person is coming from, rather than just. Kick just uh, you you're just in your world and with your ideas and you're just your peer group and you're not listening to the other person because not pe not all people they're not just doing saying something because they're stupid or something right they they say something because there's something feel there's a feeling that they have uh, so uh, because if, for example if i if if i don't know you because you have a certain experience which which what you believe right so that's uh, it needs to be right. understood that it's very important to have these discussions and do it in a peaceful and you know what do you call this in a sort of a exactly. different way, right? <laughs> exactly. It's nice to talk to people, you know, and like have actual discussions with people, you know. Yeah. You know, have an actual conversation with somebody. If you don't understand their point of view, ask. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, so uh, Justin, so you uh, you said your your daughters are actually coming, like recorded the song, and you know, in your new album, uh, are you happy that they are also taking sort of your part on like interest in music? And uh... yeah, I think it's great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it was really fun. So I didn't force it on them or anything like that. Like, you know, like I, uh, I gave Kali, my, uh, my oldest, I gave her a harmonica when she was right, uh, her first Christmas. So she, her birthday's in January. And so before she turned one, you know, I gave her this harmonica and she was using it as a rattle. I gave it to her for solstice and, uh, she was using it as just a rattle, like in the case. And then, you know, she was at the time like pulling up and like starting to stand up and like taking steps, holding on to stuff. Hmm. And then one day she, I like opened the case and handed it to her and she looked at me, looked at the harmonica, pulled out the harmonica, stood up, put the harmonica in her mouth and started playing it and walked to me. I was like, you went from crawling to walking and playing the harmonica? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it was uh, a <laughs> right. So uh, so Justin, uh, what's your message to people? You know, listening to your songs and support you. Uh, what's your message to them? Uh, thank you, everybody that's listening to my music, and thank you all for your support. Um, just try to push the positivity, you know. And like I know, not all my songs are all about positivity. It's, you know, all my songs are about a wide range of feelings and emotions, but you know, um, in general, like, I think that if my music touches you in any way, like I really, then I'm doing my job, you know? I, uh, music has helped save my life and, you know, has helped me to still be here. And, 
you know, it's never too late to start playing. If you want to play music, it's never too late to start playing. You can always find your music, right. you know, no matter what, you know, like I, I know people, I mean, Bill Withers is in the rock, rock and roll, rock and roll hall of fame now. And he didn't even start playing music till his late thirties. Right. You know, like it's never too late to find what makes you happy. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Anybody you want to shout out to? Yeah, I got a, obviously the whole band, everybody that we record this album, um, it's going to be, keep an eye out for this album. We're going to be releasing them. Hopefully, uh, our, our goal is to release them both by the end of the year. Um, definitely one of them will be out by the end of the year. Um, got to give a big shout out to uh, Stony Chicken, who made this amazing glass chain for me. Wow. That's a big opal in it. <laughs> he's an amazing glass artist uh he lives in uh lives here in the states he's in arizona but uh makes a bunch of cool really like high-end glass jewelry and things like that he's in some uh, galleries art galleries and things. um got to give a big shout out to my family my daughters and my fiance obviously i love y'all so much danielle kali lily love y'all and uh big shout out to yay plus and everybody that we're working on uh on our on our mission to push positivity with and uh all my friends that i've lost thank you for your support and i know y'all are looking down spreading your love i can feel it thank you my brother lk thank you very much he was my mentor that kind of helped push me even further when i was in the wheelchair he was helping booking me and things like that um Mm -hmm. he uh unfortunately passed away in 2015 as one of my best friends and my mentor and he introduced me to Jim Hyatt who made my amazing custom guitar Um, and yeah there's a lot of people I could go on and on and on and on (laughs) for all my saviors and heroes I do have to say a big thank you for the people that kept me alive through you know when I was attacked by the police you know Jackie Miller thank you very much Danielle, my fiance, is the massage therapist that got me out of the wheelchair. So nice. big shout out to everybody that's been there. Right. <clears throat> so Justin, uh, this was a great. Uh, I I really enjoy talking to you. Uh, it feels really great to do this early morning here in in the Philippines, and uh, I'm looking forward to your you know your new albums uh, and keep keep. I know that you have so many albums lined up <laughs> so many music lined up so looking forward to those albums and uh, your your endeavor with the uh, yay plus and all this so i hopefully i can i can see your performance your live stream hopefully <laughs> and uh, so keep making good music and putting out positivity and i wish you all the best uh, thank, thank you, you for joining much. the podcast uh, i really appreciate you joining the podcast I appreciate you having me. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you. Have a great day, Justin. Great. Yes, sir. Much love, everybody.